we're okay. Um, one evidence of what we're looking at today about this country and the world and how it's rebelling against God and it needs to repent. One evidence is something that happened two days ago to this church. Two days ago, our church website was broken into by a perverted person. They figured out how to get into our church website and they hid some code in our church website that if you went to Google and you put in Believer's Bible Fellowship Church and all your search results came up, the very first one was to a uh, pornographic website. And so I spent hours, two days, working with our host to make sure that doesn't happen again, but we're in the process of trying to clean that up. And I'm praying to God, and, and would appreciate your prayers, that we make the right decisions about what to do. Uh, and, and if we do have a website, how we can uh, maybe be better about protecting it. But that's just evidence of the perverted uh, sin that's in this world that somebody would come into a church website to make it so that someone would end up on a pornographic website if they were searching for this church. you know. And these things are around us today and they're getting worse. And today what we're going to look at and, uh, and search out in the scriptures too is the nature and the personality of the United States of America. Do you remember last time when we looked at this, we looked at the nature and personality of Nineveh, that city that is actually today near or what we call Mosul, which is in northern Iraq. And we looked at the demographics of that city. We looked at the gods that they served. We looked at the prophecies that God gave against that city. And uh, we got an idea about what Nineveh was like and why God was considering destroying Nineveh. Because we'd already seen that finally Jonah, after he got swallowed by a big fish and got thrown up on the, the seashore, uh, he, he finally answered God's call and went to Nineveh. And when he did, they repented and God held back His judgment. So today we're looking at our country, and I've listed some things on the back of the bulletin or my sermon notes, um, and I've listed some things about our country that are just uh, interesting because they, they uh, explain the size of our country and the extent of our country and, and what all's involved. And I'm going to give you a few... Uh, facts that are in addition to what is here. But let's look at some of these demographics about the United States of America. Now, some of these are from the previous census, the United States census data. So they might be a few years old, but these are, these are pretty close to the way things are today. Our country, in terms of its size, takes up about 3.8 million square miles. So we, we are a, a large country compared you know, to other countries in the world. Our population is estimated somewhere around 321 million people right now. If you divide the size of our country by the number of people, and we're only talking about an average here, so it's, it's going to be more in some places and less, but on the average, that works out to 84 individuals per square mile. Now, we know that in some of the large metropolitan areas, there's a whole lot more than 84 people in a square mile. 
But we also know out in Montana and Idaho and some of these places that there's much uh, fewer than 84 people per square mile. So <clears throat> all we're trying to do here is show the vast size of our country. We are a huge country. You know, if you get in a car and you drive the speed limit from one uh, from the Atlantic Ocean over to the Pacific Ocean, you're going to be doing well to, to make it in like four days. So it, ta it takes a while to get across our country. We are a large country with a large population uh, relative to some other countries. If you look at our median income, a household, the median, now the median is the middle, so if you look at all incomes and you just say, okay, there are this many households, if you just take the middle, the middle median income is about $53,000 a year. If you do it per capita, per person, it's about $28,000 uh, per year. Well, if you have 321 million people in this country, and you do apply the per capita, not everybody makes that. Some people make a whole lot less. Some people make a whole lot more. But if you take the $28,000 per capita, you end up with $9.2 trillion of income in a year. Now, that's a lot of money. This is a rich, rich country compared to a lot of other countries. We are one of the richest. And, and we do have money in this country. And, and this, now, the one thing I didn't put in here is employment and the number of companies and things like that because honestly, today, <clears throat> I don't trust the statistics. I, I think that they are twisted to make them look good. They're, they're worse, I believe, than what they really are as far as unemployment and people not being able to find a job. So you, so I, I really didn't put anything in here about that, but it is an issue. Now let's look at the uh, age distribution in this country today. Roughly 23% are under 18 years old, and about 14 or 15% are above 65. So the majority of our population is 18 to 65, about 63% of our population. But we do have a, a fourth of it being young, what, what we call, especially here in our church, what we call young people, uh, whippersnappers, uh, or whatever you want to call it, uh, millennial, uh, millennia. Um, but it, that's where the majority of our population is. So today, if we're talking about reaching people for Jesus, okay, um, about a fourth of them are, are really young people. And then we have an older generation, but the majority are, are in that middle range. Now, <clears throat> in the United States, the, the most current statistics I could find is we have a, a, around 6,700 people die each day in this country. 6,700. However, in any one day, on the average, there's about 12,000 births. So we have almost twice the number of births in this country as we do deaths. So there is a constant uh, flowing in of younger people in this country. Okay, And then uh, I went ahead and I looked at abortion deaths because I think that's important. That's one of the things... Um, that that uh, Nineveh in their uh, pagan worship, uh, they had no problem sacrificing babies. It was part of their worship to the to Moloch and the the god of Baal. And so I I went ahead and put this in. In 2014, a few years ago, 977,000 abortion deaths in that one. One year. In 2012, just to put those deaths in perspective, 
85% of those abortion deaths were to unmarried uh, women. And then, to, to dig down even a little bit further, I found a survey where those who had had abortions, 75% said that they had the abortion because the baby would interfere with their work or their school or their other responsibilities. So they just got rid of it. Crime is an interesting statistic. And to tell you the truth, this surprised me. I looked at, uh, at statistics that compared 1980 to 2013. In 1980, there were 597 violent crimes, that's murder, rape, the kind of violent crimes, per 100,000 inhabitants, 597. Well, it dropped to 368 by 2013. So we've had a drop in violent crime, which is encouraging, you know. Uh, burglary. Uh, went from 1684 per 100,000 inhabitants down to 610. And auto theft went from 502 down to 221. So there's some improvement in this country uh, in the last several years in the crime rate. So these are just a few demographics to point out, um, kind of give us a perspective about our country. Now, Glenn and Dorothy have, <clears throat> have a, a, a document here. They're going to, I think you made enough copies for everybody, didn't you? And uh, they'll, they'll give you these. And it's worth sitting down and taking a look at. Um, it, did you already give them out? Okay. So you have these statistics. And uh, it's, it's worth reading down through here. But it's, the title of it is, is an interesting title. America, the new mission field. You know, when we think of missionaries, we think of like Mike, and we think about Jeanette, who were in Brazil. We think about going to another continent even. But in fact, the mission field here is ripe right now. And there's a lot of statistics here. Uh, churches, and these are the ones that caught my eye, churches are losing... Uh, 2.7 million people per year in this country. People are, are stopping from attending church. Um, it only takes one year for 80% of new church plants to die, to just fold up, close the doors. Um, also, um, only 1% of churches that say they're evangelical are actually winning their own soul. Ninety yeah. percent um, of people who claim to be a Christian have never won a soul to Jesus Christ, never participated in helping bring somebody to the Lord. Um, if we had the current rate of churches with our population growth, and we just saw that we are growing in population. If we had the current number of churches per uh, population growth, we would need 3,205 new churches each year to keep up with the growth. And yet, we have churches closing their doors. So this country, is in, in a lot of cases, is upside down as far as... Uh, the direction that it's going. And I know just because somebody attends church does not necessarily mean they have a relationship with the Lord, but it's an indicator of the value that our population in this country place on a relationship with God. And so these are just uh, some statistics that are interesting. In my notes, I also talked a little bit about some statistics related to uh, different religions. Um, the first one that I listed for you is in this country today, 
about 71% of people say they are Christian. About 6% say they are non-Christian, which would include Jews, uh, Hindus, Islam, the, the other religions. And the interesting fact that I ran across is almost a fourth of the people in this country say they uh, are affiliated with no Christian, no belief. Uh, and and uh, if you look at worship, you can see it reflected there. 37% of those in the survey I looked at said they attend worship weekly. A third said they attend it at least monthly. But almost 30% of the people surveyed said they seldom or never, ever attend worship. So we've got basically a third of our population who are not meeting in churches, who are not fellowshipping with believers, and who do not worship in the church. Um, I found an Oregon statistic, and in this state, 40%, 40% of the people in the state of Oregon say that they seldom or never attend worship. We are the new mission field, if you want to look at it that way. Oregon is a, a mission field all around us. What was interesting in this same survey, I also found that 59% of those who replied to it said that they felt spiritually at peace and they felt like that their well-being was, uh, was good and at peace. So you, you find people feeling a spiritual contentment without a, a large number being involved in worship or fellowshipping in a church. So that spiritual peace has to be coming from somewhere. And I would propose today that it's, it's from false religions and from false spirituality and from pagan religions that we have among us today. They're called by different names uh, than they, they used to be. But they're the same gods. They're the same idols there. And then finally, if you look in our country today and you have to answer the question, what is the fastest growing religion in the United States today? That The answer to that are, is two, two religions. One is Islam and the other is called Wicca or the witchcraft. Those two are growing. Now, those are growing faster than Christianity in this country. They are being accepted and people are getting involved in those religions more than Christianity in this country. So that sort of sets the stage for uh, this next point uh, in my notes. <clears throat> Why are the statistics for this country the way they are. I want to propose that we look at what has been put in the place of God in this country. Because then you can understand these statistics. It, it, it'll help you understand these statistics. So what I'm going to do is walk through a few of the more well-known names for Jehovah. And we're going to focus on what those names say about God. And then we're going to look at how this country has replaced what God is in these names with something else. So let's take the first one, for instance. Jehovah Yireh, the Lord who provides. Now, the, these uh, names are in the Hebrew and they're in the Old Testament. So, God is, Jehovah is called the Lord who provides. 
The scripture and where you find this mentioned in Hebrew is Genesis 22:14. And do you remember the story where God told Abraham to do something that it just sounds uh, like God would never ask one of us to do this? He told Abraham, you know, he had a son, Isaac. He had already <laughs> promised Abraham that through his son, the entire earth would be blessed. Okay, So he'd already made a promise to Abraham. And he came to Abraham and he said, I want you to take your son uh, and I want you to take him up on the mountain that I tell you and I want you to carry some wood and I want you to put him on an altar I want you to kill him with a knife and I want you to burn him as a sacrifice to me. Wow. Now I've had some dreams where I feel like God was talking to me. Some of you have had dreams or visions. I know you have because you've talked about it, where you felt like God gave you a word. How would you like to get that word in the middle of the night? Gary, you go take your youngest daughter, Betsy, who lives here in Bend, and you take her up somewhere up on Mount Bachelor, and you take a knife, and you put her on a pile of stones, and you kill her, and then you burn her body as a sacrifice to me. I can't imagine getting that word from God. But Abraham did. And he said, absolutely not, God. And he turned around and he ran the other way. Is that right? Is that what he did? No. No, he didn't. He gets a, a pack, probably a pack uh, mule or camel or something, or donkey. He loads it with wood. And his son says, Father, where are we going? And Abraham says, we're going up on the mountain here to offer sacrifice to God. What would you say to your son if he turned around and said, well, Father, I see the wood for the sacrifice. I see that we're going to go up and build an altar. But where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? Abraham had to tell him that he was the sacrifice. And you know what's interesting to me? You don't read that his son took off running down the mountain to get away. <laughs> he actually went along with it. And Abraham put the wood on it, made an altar, put the wood up on the altar tied him up on the altar, went so far as to have his hand raised, ready to kill him, and an angel spoke to him at that moment, the angel of the Lord, and told him not to do it, and stopped him at the very moment. And God told Abraham, I now know that you have faith in me. I now know that you trust me because in your heart you were willing to do this. And we know from the scripture it tells us that do you remember what it said Abraham believed? If the scripture tells us that Abraham actually believed that if he killed his son Isaac that God would raise him up because of the promise that God had made that through his son, all the earth would be blessed. Isn't that amazing? Well, when he didn't kill Isaac, he turned around and there stuck in the bushes was a ram with his horns hung up in the bushes. And that's where this phrase, Jehovah Jireh, 
comes from in this story because God provided. God provided. I did a little research, uh, listened to a rabbi uh, online teaching about this particular name of God, and he said it carries with it the idea of something God does at the exact right moment that it's needed. So it's not just that he provides, but he provides at the exact moment that the need is there. And he steps up and he is the provider. Well, as we go through each one of these this morning, I'm going to ask you, where or how have we as a country turned against this, this uh, description of who God is? How have we turned against God the provider? Well, I want to propose to you that we have replaced him with other things and other people that we think are our provider. One, and, and I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, one of them is government. We have replaced God, some in this country, with government. Government is our provider. We give government credit. We give government thanks. We look to government. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't programs and provisions for us as a nation, but what I am saying is that we have focused on that as a nation as our provider. God is the one who gives us these things. God is the one who blesses us as a country. He is our provider. Okay, And we have pushed Him aside which is sin, which needs to be repented of. So this is one area. I'll try to move through these fairly quickly because I have quite a few listed here. Jehovah Rapha. This is the, God, this is the Lord who heals. Now, if you look at Exodus 15 and read these verses, you'll find that God is talking to the Israelites and what He's saying to them, if you will listen to me, if you will do what I ask you to do, and if you will follow my commands, I, the Lord, will bring none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. So he made it conditional. <clears throat> but it's very clear that he says, I will be the one who heals you. Now, it carries with it the idea of not that God is a physician or a doctor. It carries with it the idea that God is your doctor, and your doctor, and your doctor, and your doctor. He's our individual healer. Okay? And we have replaced God as our healer. <coughs> Excuse me. We've done it. He blesses us with doctors. He blesses us with medicine. We watched a miracle happen to someone a few years ago. And we all gave God the credit. And then I listened to somebody say, <clears throat> it was really the medicine. It was really the treatment. <coughs> and they took from God the glory. They took from Him the acknowledgement by us that he had healed. Because it was terminal. The guy was going to die from it. We, and God works through doctors, and God works through medicine, there's absolutely no doubt. <coughs> but, when we start giving all of that the credit, and leave God out, we have turned 
from Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Nisi is the next one. The Lord is our banner. <coughs> if you remember, this is a story where Israel was doing battle and uh, uh, Moses was to hold the staff and as long as it was in the air, uh, there was uh, they were winning the battle. But the minute he let that go down, there was uh, they started losing the battle. And so they set him on a rock so he could hold his arms up. Bless you. Thank you, Ken. Very much. And you know what they had to do? Because he got so tired. They had to come in and they had to hold his arms up for him. You know. And when it talks about he is our banner, uh, God is our, Jehovah is our banner. It's talking about us lifting up our, our lives to God and relying on Him to be our banner. And as long as we hold God up in our lives, uh, we can be strong in the Lord. The minute we allow Him to not be our banner and we replace Him with other things that we hold up, then uh, we begin to lose the battle uh, and, and we can be attacked. Um, Jehovah Ra, this is the Lord is my shepherd and typically uh, Psalms 23 is used here but I've given you Genesis 48:15. Because here, uh, the scripture talks about being fed all my life. It's talking about a shepherd feeding the sheep. God is our shepherd. He leads us into pastures. He leads us where we need to be fed. He takes the, uh, the, the flies that try to get in a sheep's nose. He, he keeps that all clean. Uh, he looks out for the wolves in our life. God is our shepherd, Jehovah. Now, this country has turned from him as a shepherd and is looking for other people and other things to be shepherds, to provide, to protect, uh, to care for, and to provide pasture. Um, Sekenu, Jehovah Sekenu, the Lord is our righteousness. This is talking about, uh, and Jeremiah is where we find this in 23, this is talking about we have a king who brings about law and order is what this means of Jehovah. He's, he's a just God um, and he represents our righteousness. It is not us who are righteous, but He is righteous. And our righteousness comes from Him. Well, we in this country have turned away from God as righteousness, and we have made other things be our righteousness. Okay? And, and we judge people and cities and government based on our righteousness and what we do that makes us right when in fact it's God and His righteousness that we should be depending upon. Two others quickly here. Jehovah Shalom. This is the Lord is, is our peace or my peace. You know when, when Jews meet they don't say hello. They say Shalom. It, and it, it means peace in Hebrew. But it carries with it the idea of peace in all areas of your life. Not just you're not in a battle, but peace in your finances, peace in your health, peace in your family, uh, peace in whatever work you're called to do, peace in your relationship with God. It is much more than what we probably think of when we hear the word peace. Well, we have replaced that. We have replaced God as a country. And He is not this country's peace. Now, 
understand everything I'm saying. There are people in this country like us who are believers. Everybody in this country has not replaced God. But a lot of people in this country have. And we are where we are and we are what we are because these have been replaced with other things. And so we look to treaties with countries. We look to diplomats. We look to uh, programs. We look to all kinds of things that we think are going to bring about peace when in fact Jehovah Shalom is who brings about peace in our life. And then finally, Jehovah's Shabbat. This is the Lord of hosts and the Lord of armies. This is talking about legions if you get into the Hebrew. And I listened to a rabbi teach on this particular name of God this past week. And what he was teaching and explaining is it's multiple armies. It's legions. It's a mass of a fighting force that can fight for us and fight for God. Armies of God. Um, this is uh, one, one example of this is David and Goliath um, in 1 Samuel 17.45 if you want to add that scripture. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel 17.45 David and Goliath because if you remember Goliath mocked David. Goliath had everything that somebody in battle needed to win. He had the spears. He had the swords. He had the shields. He had people who carried it all for him. I mean, he was a formidable foe. If you went up against Goliath, you were going to lose. That's That was the thinking. Not only that, he was almost nine feet tall. So, he, you know, how are you going to win? Well, we know the story where David took a stone, he took several stones, but he took a stone in a sling and let it go, and the one place in all of the armor that was open was right here. The, the helmet didn't cover that. And that's, that's where that stone hit him, and he went down. Against all odds, he went down and died. And David cut his head off with his own sword. And this is what I wrote down, what David said. In the name of the army of the Lord. That's, that's what David spoke to Goliath. Goliath said, who are you to come against me? And he was laughing at him and making fun of him. And David said, in the name of the army of the Lord, Jehovah Sabah. Okay. Now, we have replaced God as a country, with military, with weapons you would not believe the capability. Our strength and our security is based on our military. Now, I'm not saying it, that it doesn't help us, but when we put all of our trust in that and not in God, you can have all the military in the world. Just ask, the, just ask the Arab nations that came against Israel in 1967. And they, they had it all. They couldn't lose. And Israel, comparatively, had almost nothing. And yet, all these Arab nations, they were routed. They lost the 67 war. And you can... There are stories that you can read that, that were told and written by the enemy about all these huge armies they heard and, and, and they saw. And the average person standing there didn't hear or see any of them, but they did. God fought for them. God's army overcame. And so when we replace God, we start relying on our, ourselves. Now, 2 Corinthians 2 that, that Mike read and that he talked about, it's, it's evidence of the lawlessness among us in this country. 
Now, I don't want to say that there aren't a lot of believers in this country who are what keep this country being as good as it is. And when I say good, I'm talking about a godly, God-fearing country. We do that. But if you look at the Ten Commandments and you walk down through them, and then you put the news today right beside those Ten Commandments, and you look at the news reports, and you look at the videos, and then you read down through. It's, it's the opposite of God's law and who God is. And a big part of our country has turned away from God. Not only that, <clears throat> they aren't just His law, but this country has said, we don't want to see those laws in public. You can't take religion and put it in public government. And so you can't have the Ten Commandments in a courthouse that's trying to make decisions about people's lives and whether they know it or not, a lot of those decisions are based on these Ten Commandments, these Ten Principles. And, and yet we, we take them down. You can't have them in your school. You can't teach them. The only place you can have them is in church. And we don't want anybody in church because you are bigots. You are racist. You are e everything that the world wants to call you because you hold to these principles that are godly. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. If you haven't read it lately, I want to encourage you to go read it. There are seven things that God hates. It's good just to go back and read those every now and then. The things that He hates. One of them that He hates, really hates, is the shedding of innocent blood. 977,000 innocent persons in the womb or partially out of the womb nowadays were killed because they weren't convenient. Go look at these seven things that God hates. And then, if you haven't already, pray for our country. Because those things, if you walk down through there, they're, they're just evident all around us. And it used to be, if you were caught up in any of those seven things, you were shunned by society, by your community. You were considered to somebody, as somebody who was lawless. Well, I want to end today on Isaiah 5.20. And the thought in this scripture is, and this is true in the last days, what is evil is called good. What is good is called evil. What Mike talked about with the transgender bathrooms, something that's evil is being called good. And if you don't go along with it, you are called evil. Everything is, Satan is trying to turn things around so that this country will not serve God, will not hold him up as all of these Jehovah's that we looked at, but they will look at him as a mean, vengeful God that you should reject and that you shouldn't follow. You shouldn't teach. You know, there will come a time, and it's already here a little bit, but there will come a time when anybody in a church like this who is teaching truth could end up in jail. Right now in the state of Oregon, you cannot decide who 
you will serve or not serve in your business based on your religious convictions. You're not allowed to do that anymore in this state. Just recently, the Supreme Court made it illegal for any state to refuse for people of the same sex to be married. You, you, it's a law now in this country, not just in this state, in this country. It's a law. <clears throat> so I, you know, I don't, I don't have a license to do marriage. And I, I'm probably not going to get one, uh, you know. And and there's some pluses and minuses about that. I've even had believers tell me, you know, you're 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 being a coward here. But there are more important things, I think, if if people are just going to follow that false. Uh, it's really sin. It's a pagan religion. Is what it is. It's part of what was in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, and now it's legal here in this country. So the important thing out of today is we as a country have a lot of good things. We have a lot of good people in this country. But we also have a lot in this country, things and people that are turning away from God and, and turning to something else when it should be God. And we need to repent as a country and turn back to God. Next week we're going to look at God's warning to Nineveh. That'll be interesting. And then the week after we're going to look at God's warning to this country. So why don't we end in prayer and ask God's blessing on this word. Father, I, I just thank you for your word. It's so clear. You are so uh, revealing to us, God letting us know who you are. All these names, God, that have been given to you, they, they represent who you are. And Lord, I pray that you will use this church in this community to begin to remind people of who you are and ask them to turn back to you and repent of replacing you, God. There is no replacement for you, but they try. Lord, we pray for salvation. We pray for repentance. We pray for revival in this country. And we thank you for using this little church to help bring that about. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>